Welcome back, AP Psych community. My name is Ms. Del Savio from Walt Whitman High School. I'm here today to talk about development. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Let me share my screen with you and go ahead and get us started with today's presentation. So what are we going to be learning today? Today, a lot, actually. First of all, I want to just give you a picture of you. Yes, that was you a long time ago when you were just a little zygote. And look at where you are now. And really what we're talking about today is how'd you get from there to where you are today when you look in the mirror. So AP Live Psychology Session 6, there is the QR code. And for those of you that are new to this, if you go ahead and scan that QR code, you'll be able to give us some feedback, ask questions, and participate in Stump the Teacher, where you give us three completely unrelated AP Psychology concepts, and you see if we can loop them all together. We're going to start off looking at Dr. Swope's uh, FRQ that he gave yesterday uh, in the memory unit. I will move on to you to do Stump the Teacher from some uh, of the entries yesterday. I'll go into unit six, developmental psychology, present to you a practice FRQ, and then answer questions that had been posted over the last couple of days. I'm gonna operationalize stump. What does it mean to stump the teacher? Well, it took me more than 30 seconds to come up with a scenario to link them all together. And the first one, standard deviation, homeostasis, spotlight effect, otherwise known as imagination, imaginary audience. Well, standard deviation, if you remember, is a measure of variability. How spread apart is data, okay? okay. And homeostasis is bringing your body back down to a balanced state. And the imaginary audience or spotlight effect is this idea that many adolescents have that you are always in the spotlight, that people are watching you. So every little good thing or bad thing that you do is highlighted. So here's how I put it together. And I started off with a representative sample of residents in Chicago between the ages of 13 and 50 were asked how embarrassed would they feel on a scale of one to 10. They found out they've been walking around the city with toilet paper trailing from the waist of their pants. I know that's never happened to you, but I definitely had it on my shoe one time and it was embarrassing. The standard deviation was two points among those 13 to 50 year olds. But when the researchers calculated the standard deviation among just adolescents, it was much smaller at two points. And that's because, sorry, much smaller at 0.7 points because adolescents tend towards the spotlight effect and believe that their actions are noticed by others. So their embarrassment scores were more clustered together. Now, if an adolescent did realize that they had been carrying around some excess toilet paper, their sympathetic nervous system would respond by raising their heart rate and dilating their pupils. But once they realized that maybe nobody saw them, they'd calm down and come back down to homeostasis. Yeah, those are those three. Let's take a look at the others. General adaptation syndrome, psychoanalysis, and attribution theory. General adaptation syndrome, I'm focusing on the exhaustion stage. Remember, there is the alarm, uh, there's the resistance, and then there's exhaustion, okay? So when we talk about um, psychoanalysis, I'm gonna look at Freud's and attribution theory is uh, Kelly's attribution theory, where we look at people and we say, hmm, the reason for their behavior, is it situational or is it dispositional? And we evaluate them based upon the consistency, the consensus, and the distinctiveness of it. So my scenario, Clarice is a type A personality. She had prolonged anxiety and stress over having to have everything perfect. She was so exhausted from that stress, she became very ill. Cortisol levels had raised. She finally sought help from in the form of psychoanalysis. And in each of the three sessions she went to, her therapist kept showing her these like strange ink blots and asking her about sexual imagery. And Clarice attributed this to the therapist being a sexual deviant. So it was a dispositional one. And she said the reason she did that is because she did not know anyone else who looked at ink blots and saw erotic images. So low consensus. And the therapist spent three sessions doing this high consistency. Oh, and she saw a book on his shelf that was called Sex, Death, and the Superego, Low Distinctiveness. So which one of these stumped me? Which one did it take me longer than 30 seconds to come up with the answer? And it was the first one. So good job whoever submitted that. Moving on to the review of the FRQ that Dr. Swope gave you, and it was all about Dory. Dory is an absent-minded high school student. She can't seem to remember anything. And she gave you four terms, and those four terms you had to link to how they would help Dory remember, and then three terms of how it would hinder Dory's ability to remember. So we're going to start with elaborative rehearsal, when you try to make sense of uh, information and code information by making a connection to something that's meaningful to you, maybe some other old information you have, or something about yourself. So I'm using the self-reference effect, and I said Dory will remember swim practice is at six, because she consciously makes a connection between that time and her birthday, which happens to be April 6th. 
the sensory registry Dr. Swope went over as being the first line in the information processing model where that echoic and uh, iconic memories are very fleeting, but, but they have a, can store quite a bit of information. So if Dory will, will remember her assignments if she pays attention to her teacher, and when her teacher tells the class about the assignment and enters into her echoic memory, Dory will have time to write it down. Okay, we'll have a better chance of completing her assignment on time. A schema, we're gonna spend a lot of time today about schemas. It's really our conceptual understanding about the way things work. And if Dory has a schema, which clearly does not include the need to write down homework, but if she modifies her schema to include need to write down homework um, and the due date of it, she can refer to it at home and avoid turning it in late. And crystallized intelligence, that's the intelligence, like a crystal, like those kits you used to get when you were younger, you put a little, Thing in there like emerald i've tried to grow emeralds it didn't work but it would grow over time that's crystallized intelligence so once story starts to write down her homework she will build her knowledge okay this is crystallized intelligence that her homework due date is in her notebook and then she can find it when she sits down to work and it will help her to remember when it's due but what about hindering hindering dory's memory so what we have here and i think i did have some problem here but it's okay the availability heuristic that availability heuristic is a mental shortcut. I'm just gonna change this out over here. I'm gonna put this tip up there later, but it is a mental shortcut. And it's based upon when we make a decision that the first thing that comes to your mind. So the first thing that comes to Dory's mind is food when she sees it at six o'clock rather than her six o'clock swim practice. So she eats and she forgets to go. And then there's proactive interference. And that is when old memories interrupt our ability to correctly recall our new memories. So her old swim practice used to be at 7.30, and that's when she thinks swim practice is because it's interfering with her ability to recall her new memory. Now, what I did do is put a little memory tool in here so you can see it. Um, <laughs> go ahead and come back here. Okay, if you have problems with remembering retrograde amnesia, interrograde amnesia, retroactive interference, proactive interference, with retro, I try to say, just remember, the problem is with the prefix. The problem is remembering the prefix. In other words, retro meaning old. So if it's retroactive interference, the problem would be remembering old stuff. And then proactive would be the opposite, okay? Hopefully that helps you a little bit. It's helped you to remember that. Source amnesia is when you forget where the information came from. And Dory often thinks that she heard from her teachers that there's no homework, but really what she heard it from was her sister who's in kindergarten and says that there is no homework. Okay, so what are we gonna learn today in terms of content? Uh, we're gonna start with themes of development, move through different types of development, including some, um, uh, we're gonna also look at cluster B and cluster C personality disorders and how th those may come from different development environments. Then we'll look through some, we'll do some skills explaining how nature and nurture contribute to development, looking at the research methods, and again, differentiating between personality disorders. Okay, so when we talk about themes of disorders, themes, we have nature versus nurture. You've heard this a lot. To what extent are you, are you who you are due to genetics uh, or due to your environment? Continuity versus discontinuity. You may recall Erickson and Piaget and Kohlberg had these stages of development. It's called discontinuous development. They believed you accumulate a bunch of you know, skills and or knowledge, and then you move on to the next stage. Vygotsky will look at him. He looked at a continuous growth path, continuity, where you learn one skill. And it's like climbing up the stairs. You can learn the next skill, the next one, and it's not a whole bunch of skills together. And then, of course, we have to look at what stays the same and what changes over time. Okay. There are some traits we know that are stable and those that change. So I'm talking a little bit about epigenetics because that is a term we see used more often now. And the epigenetic studies is when they, scientists will study changes. And when I say phenotypical changes, I'm talking, talking about observable changes in gene expression. Um, the DNA sequence remains unchanged, but the actual expression of that DNA can change based upon a marker being present are not present. And of course, I'm simplifying this. So if you take someone with green eye, brown eye genotype, and there's a marker that stops the green eye from being displayed, okay, so you, it has the marker and you're not going to see green eyes in that person, that person will show up with a phenotype, an observable trait of brown eyes. But if that marker through some maternal stress or there, there's changes that can happen inside the, the uterus that can change that marker, the availability of that marker, that child might be born with two green eyes, okay? DNA sequence the same, 
This is going to become important when we talk about um, epigenetics and disorders. The other thing I want to talk about is the exomic one explanation, possible explanation of disorders called the diathesis stress approach. And this explains disorders in terms of that interaction between nature and nurture. So let's say somebody is born with what we call a high diathesis, a, a, you know, a, a genetic vulnerability okay, for depression or anxiety. So that arrow there is indicating that it's high level of diathesis. Only a small amount of stress Okay, something in, in nurture, something of the environment could induce and could bring about the display of depression or anxiety, like the death of a family pet. Now, if I switch these up a little bit, okay, and you see here, now the genetic predisposition is low. It would take a lot more, or many more stressors to bring about depression or anxiety. So it could you not only have the death of a family pet, it could be moving during your senior year. I don't know any parent who is that cool, but they might. COVID, obviously. So there might have to be a lot of things piled on. I also want to talk about heritability versus heredity, because a lot of people confuse that. So what is heritability? Um, it is the extent to which, if you look at a population, like look at all your classmates on Zoom, and it's the extent to which those, those observable differences between you and your classmates are due to genetic factors, like hair color, right? eye color, uh, height, it is not how likely it is that you're going to inherit a certain trait, an observable trait, like blue eyes, height, weight, okay, from your parents. So one is about the difference among a population, that variation in a population due to genes, whereas heredity is more about how, you know, how free, what's the chance you're going to uh, get a trait from your parents. Two different things, and here's an example I want to give to you. And, and again, we are talking about populations here. So depending upon heritability studies, you need to look at the population they're observing. Heritability will measure between zero and one. Zero means there's little likelihood that genetics has anything to do with it. It's all about environment. Whereas one means genetics is a big component of it. So let me take, and this is kind of a ridiculous example, but maybe we'll help you remember, using two legs to walk. Now, using two legs to walk has low heritability. You might be like, huh? Well, think about it. What is the reason why somebody with two legs might not be able to walk? And typically, we're talking about environmental influences, like they broke their leg, okay? Or they had an injury to their leg that's permanent, or they had to have an amputated leg. So those are environmental factors, which means that heritability is pretty much close to zero. In other words, the variation among those people who can walk with their two legs and those who can't walk is likely due to environmental factors, okay? Um, the heredity, though, of getting two legs, of being born with two legs is like 100%. Right? Human DNA contains those messages to develop two legs and the muscles necessary to walk. Now we're gonna move this to schizophrenia. Now schizophrenia has high heritability. And how do we know that? Well, we know that due to twin studies, which are studies that are done for developmental purposes, Twins are the favorites of scientists, right? Researchers, they can actually take a look at identical twins, those monozygotic twins, MZ, dizygotic twins, those are the ones that are fraternal twins, and compare those that were raised together, raised apart, twin studies are the favorites. So a 2017 twin study, tens of thousands of twins, right, was done and we found heritability to be of schizophrenia to be about 0.83. And what does that mean? It means that the variation among all those twins, that was the population they studied, the variation and the presence of symptoms of schizophrenia is very likely due to genetic factors. Okay? Now, when we talk about heredity, the truth is that some estimates have children at about a 40% risk of developing schizophrenia if both parents have it. But these are two different numbers. I'm talking about studies. There are cross-sectional studies when you take different subjects and you look at them at a single point in time. Okay? So you might have compare fluid intelligence of in group one, 10 year olds, group two, 25 year olds, and group three, 45 year olds. Of course, you'd find fluid intelligence would decline as you got older. Longitudinal studies take a look at the same exact group of people at different points in time. So you may compare, for example, you know, the same group, at three different points in time, like the health of identical twins as they pass through their life. Now you can take a look at what remains the same and what changes. 
I'm going to move into biological development, and I'm just going to spend a lot of time going into detail here. So don't don't try to write things down in this. It's just to give you an overview. I showed you that picture of the zygote, the, and there's an embryo and a fetus before you're born. And during this period of time inside uh, the mother's womb, you have the organs developing, your brain and your spinal cord, and a whole full complement of neurons with very few connections. And we have our primary sex characteristics that are that are developing. Now. What can happen during that development period is that exposure to any environmental harmful substance called a teratogen could actually impact development. So we've looked at alcohol and tobacco and even a maternal high fever and even maternal stress. All of these things can actually, when we talk about those epigenetic markers, remove protective markers, okay, or not allow protective marker, or I'm sorry, take markers that are bad for a child's development and keep them in place when they shouldn't be there. So if you want to know a little bit more about prenatal development, I suggest you go to topic 6.1 daily video one on AP Classroom. As we move into biological development outside of prenatal development, here's the baby who's born. We're in infancy. Remember, they have neurons, but very few neural connections. Now, over the course of that first two years, I mean, thousands and thousands of neural connections are being formed because axons are growing and reaching out and forming junctures, synapses with other neurons. Plasticity is quite high, the, the ability to, uh, to change you know, the, the neural connections. And children develop these gross motor functions. They're able to sit and crawl and walk. But if you throw a ball at a baby's face, and please don't do that, they probably wouldn't have the coordination to stop the ball from hitting their face. They'd probably blink because that's instinctual. In childhood, though, we start to see the synaptic pruning. All those connections that are weak or unused get taken away. It's good for neural efficiency. This is so good if you didn't have a lot of connections to begin with, right? But we also see development of fine motor skills. So now you can throw that ball at the three-year-old and they have a better chance of getting those hands up and catching that ball. They have much better eye, that eye-hand coordination. They can pick up small items. I used to notice like if you look at little beads for, for kids when they're, when they're young, they're big and the beads get smaller and smaller as the kids get older and older. That's considered a negative correlation, by the way. Okay, so Rosenzweig did a nurture a study about the impact of nurture on plasticity, about the changing of those neural pathways. And what he found was he took a group of rats and he put them into what he called an enriched condition. And he defined that enriched condition as being like a little rat playground with all their friends and hanging out with toys and basically living the dream. And then he took another group of rats and he sent them into a deprived condition. And that deprived condition was the rat in a cage with no friends. And then at the end of it, they all got treated equally. They all had their uh, brains dissected and they looked at the findings. And what they found were among the rats who were in the enriched condition, their frontal lobe was heavier and thicker, which meant that there were more neural connections there. Okay? They had more acetylcholine receptors. In other words, acetylcholine for learning and memory. And they had more synapses. So what we, we find is that it's really important to have that early childhood experience. So what was done with rats with Rosenzweig got translated into policy, um, education policy in our own country with Head Start programs, where we start to children from uh, lower income families in school at a much earlier age, you know, like at two or three, and we give them many hours of schooling to keep that those synapses growing and efficient. Now, we also want to talk about the Rosenzweig study as a double blind study because the rats were never told which group they were being assigned to. So they didn't know if they were in the experimental or the control group. So they were not going to give into experimental demand. And the researchers who were doing the dissection did not know whether the rats had been in the deprived condition or the enriched condition. That is a double blind study. Moving on with biological development into adolescence, this is really about puberty with the hormones and the development of those secondary sex characteristics. Do you remember that time, boys, when you had that Adam's apple pop out and all of a sudden your voice was cracking, okay? And then again, these secondary sex characteristics are not related to reproduction, but they develop during adolescence. Now we also have the human growth hormone being secreted as it was in childhood during sleep, deep sleep, so that your bones and your muscles develop and grow. And those prefrontal cortex is still developing. It's stronger than it was when you were younger, but still not strong enough to overcome that amygdala that you have that is driving more of your responses. Ooh, 
adulthood, there's a lot of changes that go on. I mean, this is just definitely one of those things that changes over time. Although the prefrontal cortex may be fully developed by early adulthood and, and some pruning is complete, the plasticity is not high. So if you are an early adult or even a late adult, you, you'd, if you had a brain injury, it would be much harder to recover from that. You, you already had all of those weak and unused connections pruned away. Okay? So it'd be a little harder to, to recover from that. In middle adulthood, it's when we start to see that frontal lobe shrink. The chromosomes are less protected at the ends of these telomeres, so they become vulnerable to a faulty replication. Eventually, um, over time, when the telomeres have completely degraded off, degraded, the cell will actually die, and that's where we start to lose mass in our frontal lobe. And we know that neurogenesis, while it does take place in the hippocampus and amygdala during our adulthood, it begins to decline in late adulthood. Uh, and here's the irony. That prefrontal cortex, last to develop, first to decline. And that means declines in working memory. Like you give me 12 numbers to remember, I, I can probably remember six, right? But when I was your age, I, might, I might have had a chance of nine. <laughs> in late adulthood, we also see a lack of impulse control because of that shrinking frontal lobe. And I put the term grandma in there to tell a story that my grandmother, who was by all accounts the nicest person in the world, when she got older, we'd go grocery shopping with her. And she'd sit there and say, <laughs> This, this woman, she doesn't know how to pack those groceries. She's putting the hot stuff in with the cold stuff and be like, uh, Grandma, she can hear you. But that was my grandmother's shrinking frontal lobe. But the good news was that exercise and new experiences can help to retain those connections and maybe slow down that process. If you want to know more about that process, go ahead and go to topic 6.5, daily video one. We're going to do some practice and do a lot of talking. So let's take a look at this particular one. This is about identical twins. And this is Kayla and Kim who are separated at birth. And they find when they are reunited that Kayla was diagnosed in her early 20s with schizophrenia. And this was after being exposed to the herpes virus 5. So if a researcher wanted to investigate the differences between these twins, what research method might they employ? I just want to point out here, this is about epigenetics, right? So the protective marker that maybe is present for Kim, and this is why Kim was an identical twin with identical DNA sequence, does not develop schizophrenia, that marker was probably removed through the exposure to this herpes virus 5. But anyway, back to the question, if a researcher wants to investigate the differences, what research method would they employ? Well, obviously they're not doing an experiment. I hope you do know that because they're not randomly assigning people to conditions. A case study seems pretty appropriate here, right? This is an unusual case. And otherwise you would never be able to study twins like this because it would be unethical to expose one of them to the herpes 5 virus. Okay. Second one, experimental research on pregnant mice would be most appropriate to determine what? So they're on pregnant mice. So what's happening in, during pregnancy that might be of interest to developmental psychologists? Give you a second to look at that one. Well, hopefully you came up with A, the effects of teratogens as harmful environmental substances that could be introduced okay, to the embryo or the fetus. Okay, moving on. We are going to social development. So why is it that Dr. Swope is so funny and is so witty, and I'm not as much. Is it our social development? Can I blame it on my parents? Like everything else, well, let's take a look at parenting styles. Now, Diana Bamron in the 1960s identified four different parenting styles. And what she came up with were permissive, sometimes called indulgent, neglectful, sometimes called uninvolved, authoritarian, ends with an N, no, 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 you don't want that parenting style, and authoritative. And she ranked them basically on warmth in terms of how warm a parent was and how much demand they put on their children. And high warmth, high support towards a child, and high demand ended up with an authoritative parenting style. And we know that authoritative parenting style is correlated correlated, does not saying it causes it, but correlated with raising children that have better social skills. They usually have better impulse control and more confidence. And let's call it efficacy towards tasks. Okay. So maybe you have a sibling. I know I do. And my parents definitely parented us differently. Like the parenting style my parents used with me was completely different than the one they use with my siblings. So, hey, why did you let her do that? Okay. <laughs> um, maybe though it was temperament. Maybe I was not an easygoing child. And so as a result, my parents had to be stricter with me. Maybe it was the friends I chose and they were friends that they didn't think were necessarily 
the best influence. And it could have been, well, I, actually, we were all girls. So for me, in my case, it wasn't gender, but there are parents who tend to be more protective over the, the girls than their boys. So parenting styles may not be uniform across children. It may have a lot to do with other factors. If you want to know more about Diana Bamron's research, please, again, visit Topic 6.2 in Daily Video 2. Infant attachment. And attachment is defined as a lasting connectedness we have between a psychological one, not, not physical, but psychological connectedness, connectedness between humans. And both Bowlby and Ainsworth, you know, agreed that attachment with the caregivers when children were young kind of set a path for development for future relationships, that intimacy we have in future relationships. Now, I'm not going to go through all of Mary Ainsworth's uh, studies with the strange situation test, but they did identify three different attachment styles, a secure attachment style, and then two what they would call insecure. One was called anxious avoidant, the other anxious resistant. Okay. And the strange situation test in brief was basically a, a parent and a child in a room with a stranger, parent leaves, and she looked at how the infant reacted parent returns, she looked at how the infant reacted. I mean, there were some more steps to it, but that's basically it. So she had to wait till the children developed uh, object permanence because they had to recognize that their parents were gone, right? So they could, that's that stranger anxiety that they should feel. Uh, so they, they, were, they were all about like anywhere from about three to I think eight months old. Now, Harry Harlow did a slightly different uh, experiment and he did it with a monkey. And he was interested to understand does attachment, that psychological connectedness come from being fed, or does it come from what he called contact comfort? So we had a little baby monkey who had a surrogate. He had two surrogate mothers, one who fed him, uh, you know, just with a bottle, and it was a wire, uncomfortable monkey. And the other was a cloth, comfortable monkey, but didn't feed the baby. And the baby developed attachment, secure attachment to the cloth monkey. And we know that the baby was securely attached because the baby was happy, explored, played around, and, and was happy to see the mother the mother, the surrogate, when the surrogate returned. So it's important to note that sensitive periods likely exist. And when we talk about a sensitive period, it's about a time period, usually you know, an expanded time period, but a period of time when it's a little bit easier for an organism to acquire some capability, like attachment or like language. So we're going to look at both attachment and language in this context of a sensitive period. Now, the theories of Eric Erickson and Mary Ainsworth are presented uh, in topic 6.2 daily video one, if you want to go into more detail about the experiments she did and attachment styles. I am going to though move into Erickson and Freud, and we're going to take a look at social development for the infant. And during this stage, Erickson said there was a conflict. There are eight conflicts that he had, eight stages. Okay. This first stage is trust versus mistrust. Can the, the child trust when they're crying in their crib for somebody to come in and comfort them or feed them or change their diaper? Or even a similar stage, it was the oral stage with the goal in this stage to become less dependent on caregivers. So yes, trust that they were there for you, but become less dependent on them. And Freud said that if in that oral stage, if a child got stuck on that stage, got fixated on that stage, it was because of one of two things. Either they were weaned, meaning taken off the bottle, too late. So like they're like three, oh, there was like an article, I don't remember, it was like six years ago, this kid was like three years old and still breastfeeding. And it was this article on the front of Time Magazine. So that would be maybe considered weaning too late. Or maybe the parents didn't you know, wean the child too quickly. So the child never got their oral needs satisfied. So what could happen as a result of that, if the child's left on that bottle or that nipple for too many years, they may develop dependent personality disorder. Now that is one of those cluster C disorders of, for personality. All cluster C disorders are more like, anxious, they're all about anxious and fearful thinking. So more anxious than they are anything else. Now, again, wean too late. You depend on others. You depend on others because your needs have always been met by your parents. And with people with dependent personality disorder, they often endure abusive relationships because they don't want to be alone. Okay. And they, they might be considered, there was a great movie called Failure to Launch. They may have to live at the home for a long time. They just don't feel they can take care of themselves and don't want to. Okay. Now I talk about Eric Erickson and uh, psychosocial development for childhood. And there were three conflicts, autonomy, initiative, and industry. Some people, instead of saying industry, they use the term competency. Either one is correct. 
So when we look at autonomy versus shame and doubt, that is where the child starts to develop some self-control, some ability to control their, their own bodily functions, like potty training. Uh, and this is kind of that stage where I do it, I do it, you know, they, they come down the stairs, I got their shoes on the wrong feet, I do it. <laughs> then there's initiative versus guilt. The child is still continuing to take to take that initiative to get dressed and they're given responsibility maybe to set the table, but they're also doing things for themselves like making plans because this is really a focus on playing with others. So uh, making play dates would be an example of that. Then you have industry versus inferiority. Now this is where children you know, are at school and they are taking a look at how do they compare with their peers socially, academically, physically. I should have put that on there. So if you're on the jungle gym and everyone else can get to the top of it and you can't, you might feel inferior. And this is often, this sense of industry or sense of competency is often guided by societal definitions of success. Okay, so it's not just uh, how a child sees themselves, but it's how they see themselves in the eyes of society. Now, this is also the stage that Freud said children were busy developing their personality. So I'm not going to go through Freud in the personality section tomorrow, I'm kind of doing it here. But there's the anal and the phallic stage. And during that anal stage, it's the idea also is to become accomplished, to become independent. And if a child gets, uh, and the whole thing's about potty training. So if the parents of the child are very strict with their potty training, the child might start to feel like they have to hold it all in. Everything has to be perfect. I can't let it go. So we call it anal retentiveness. Okay? And they might engage in compulsive behaviors because of the anxiety that they feel. Now, lack of potty training, like let my kid run out in the street and you know, figuring out one time they're gonna get potty trained, probably by the time they hit high school, well, that could lead to a child who's anally expulsive. They're messy, they're disorganized. But if we look at anal fixation and we look at compulsive behaviors like obsessive compulsive disorder, you might be able to relate it back to very strict potty training, right? This idea that there are obsessions, these unwanted thoughts, like I don't wanna get sick, I don't wanna lose something. And then there's a compulsion to relieve themselves of that anxiety by engaging in a behavior. So the compulsion is the behavior. So if you don't wanna get germs and you're scared about getting germs, wash the hands you're afraid you're gonna lose something, you may become a hoarder, okay? <laughs> um, now we move on to the phallic stage. The goal here in Freud was for the child to identify, you know, find their gender identity. And they're supposed to repress desires for their mother, for their father, by identifying with the opposite sex. So we have here is if you're fixated, according to Freud, um, you might develop low self-esteem. You don't really know who you are. You don't have an identity. You might be promiscuous looking for that identity or narcissistic, excessively vain. I hope you know where I'm going to with a personality disorder here. And that's narcissistic personality disorder. That's a cluster B. So it's not an anxious, fearful one. This is dramatic and emotional personality disorder. That's that person who has that inflated sense of that they are more important than everybody else. You know, they might spend thousands of dollars to upgrade themselves to first class because they don't think that they belong in the back with everybody else. Okay. Now, there's no doubt in childhood that there are peer influences like food preferences and accents and even belongingness but also family influences, including religious and political beliefs. And those all come together for social development. And again, think about how those parenting styles might impact social development. How about a child who wants to take initiative, but is discouraged by authoritarian parents? Moving to adolescence is where you are here, identity versus role confusion. This is where you explore who you are. You probably join lots of different clubs. You may have switched different sports. You may start doing theater when that was something you never did before. That's your identity that you're looking for. And James Marcia did identify different statuses for identity. And if you were watching any of the videos I had in daily videos, uh, I actually had something wrong on this chart. So this is the correct chart. But what we might see if I try to relate this to parenting styles is that a parenting style that's authoritative would allow freedom for that child to explore. And we would say, or James Marcy would say, that you're in the, in the moratorium stage. You're thinking, thinking, figuring out what it is that you want to do. Now, which one of these do you think is going to happen if your parents are authoritarian? They don't give you that freedom. Take a look at these. And what you might see is identity foreclosure. You don't even get to choose who you are. Your parents have decided you're going to go to the school. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And you don't get to have a say in it. Okay. So these are different identity statuses. And I just you know, note again that peer influences are quite heavy, as you know, in adolescence. And risky behavior is influenced by our peers. So is the development of our independence and the development of your identity. 
So one thing you'll note, I do not have anything in here about personality disorders. Nobody typically before the age of 18, and there are exceptions, but typically before the age of 18, we don't diagnose someone with a personality disorder. And the reason is not only does it require a longstanding pattern of behavior, and I know operationally you think that one or two years was longstanding, but it's not in the scope of a lifetime. But the other thing is this, think about some of the things that adolescents just kind of naturally have because of an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. Risky behavior, perhaps they're still trying to find out who they are, so they're dependent on others. They're lacking that impulse control due to, you know, again, prefrontal cortex. So a lot of the things that define a personality disorder are kind of in an adolescent. So it would make no sense to diagnose until there's been a longer standing pattern of that behavior. Okay. There are um, another video, topic 6.4, daily video one, which we'll talk more about identity. Okay, early to middle or late adulthood. And what we have here are three different stages or conflicts that Eric Erickson identified. And those were intimacy and isolation, which we typically you know, kind of pair with romantic relationships. So how well can somebody form those relationships? And of course, a lot of that's gonna do with how much they trust other people, right? How easily they are able to form those relationships has a lot to do with trust. Then there's generativity versus stagnation. And a lot of, that has a lot to do with parenting. A lot of people think about developing a meaningful contribution as being a parent, but there are other things. You can volunteer, or you can be an activist, or you can be a teacher, and all those things can kind of give back to the next generation. And then ego integrity, that's where people look back on their life and reflect and hopefully positively on what they did. And of course, when they moved to Florida. Um, identity statuses may change here because you're getting lots of different identities, being a parent, being a spouse, uh, being a mentor. So you might end up in identity moratorium where you're searching that identity. Let's do some more practice here. Uh, Grace's parents grounded her the night after she failed to meet curfew. They spoke with her about the importance of curfew in terms of setting boundaries. They agreed to extend her curfew by one hour each month. Her parents demonstrate what? And hopefully you got to authoritative parenting. Okay. These others really are, there's no evidence for them um, in the prompt. Una is nine months old. She's being dropped off at a daycare center for the first time since she was born. She cries when her parents leave, but then plays happily alongside other children. Ainsworth would say that Una has secure attachment. She's able to explore, but still upset when her parents leave, but happy when they return. I am going to move through these a little quickly to get through cognitive today. Okay, so cognitive development. We're talking about all these things here. And we want to start with schemas. Schemas are those, those you know, mental structures, the way we organize our world. They're, they're our neural networks. And we use them to guide our judgment, our decision making, and our behavior. So when I think about a schema a young child might have for fish, they might start with Nemo, because that's the first fish they see. It's a clownfish. And then they say, oh, fish swim in water. There's dolphins. There's sharks. They have fins. They go to the aquarium, and they come across a seahorse. Well, they will interpret the seahorse as a fish because it seems to be a fish that swims in the water, even though it doesn't look like it, it best fits in with that schema. So they go ahead and, and say, yes, fish. And there's that seahorse now in their fish schema and they modify that schema to say, ah, not all fish have fins. So what I'm showing you here is a bit of assimilation and accommodation of schemas. And by the way, don't think that I wasn't primed when I came up with this example of Nemo because of Dr. Swope's Dory in the FRQ. So here's an example. Um, a child lives with a parent who drinks water from a mug. The child sees a mug at a friend's house, takes a drink from it, expecting water. And of course, it's not as coffee. What is this an example of? Did they make sense of this new information, this new mug using an existing scheme, or did they change one? And the answer here is, of course, I used that new information and they interpret it with an existing schema. My parent drinks water from a mug. I want a little bit more relevant for you. You have an 89.4 in English in my school. That is a B. Don't even bother asking your teacher to bump your grade because your last English teacher would not do it. What's happening here, assimilation or accommodation? Well, once again, we are making sense of new information. That's 89.4, that's your new information. And here's your existing schema. Your last English teacher wouldn't do it. So you've just interpreted something with your existing schema. Okay. Finally, you have only attended schools where there's the same schedule every day. You move to a new school and discover there are other types of schedules called blocks. Here it's accommodation. You have a you know, new stimulus, I'm sorry, an old schema, same schedule every day. And now you realize there are other types of schedules that doesn't fit with your schema. 
you modify it. So everything gets really complicated when it comes to schemas. When you get older, you know how to operate a cell phone because you have, you know, a complicated schema about electronics, or you can drive one person's car and another person's car and a rental car, because again, you have more complex schemas. You have more flexibility as we get older to think a little differently. Now we see schema assimilation in so many different concepts like mental sets, functional fixedness, behavior confirmation bias. And I have a story here, my favorite student, Ben, if I have a schema for Ben that he's a really great kid and I see him punch somebody, I'm going to interpret it using my schema. Ben's a nice kid, that must be a friendly punch. Okay. Learned helplessness, somebody interprets new situations that, that they, can't, they feel like they can't escape a bad situation because in the past they had bad situations they couldn't escape, that schema assimilation. And so is representativeness heuristic. If you're in Best Buy and you, and you try to solve a problem, trying to find someone to help you, you grab a guy with a you know, blue shirt on, mm, yeah, it's not, not a Best Buy guy all the time, but you used basically your schema for that. Okay, cognitive development in infancy, we know that Piaget uh, identified the sensory motor stage where children put everything in their mouth and they also learn they can make a noise if they hit something. And they also learn object permanence. So this is that cognitive development. They are also developing sounds, babbling, and sounds eventually really more specific to their native language. And then moral development, there is some evidence that babies are born with a sense of right or wrong. This is where we have a lot of cognitive development. Here in that stage, the two stages that Piaget identified as pre-operational and concrete. And then they also, of course, are learning language and, and putting together sentences. And they have moral development now. Now they start to solve moral questions. The first stage is that pre-conventional. What about me? Like, you know, how is this going to impact me? And then there's conventional. What do others expect of me? And then you have Lev Vygotsky, I alluded to him earlier, where he believed that it's really important to have language and language leads to learning. And so language is the cognitive component that drives the learning process. So there's a lot that goes on in these two stages here that I have another video about that I'd encourage you to take a look at. But I do wanna mention the multilinguals rule here. If you think about it, most researchers agree, it's really hard to learn a language after this period of time. And dual language learners have much thicker cortices. Think about the Rosenzweig experiment. If I think about theory of mind, which gets developed at the end of that pre-operational stage, that ability to feel empathy for others, and you try to relate that to autism, you might note that that impairment of social relationships is likely due to a lack of theory of mind. Now, if we look at Vygotsky and Benjamin Worf, again, I want to relate these two concepts. Benjamin Worf said language shapes how we think. And Vygotsky basically said this. Well, let's take conservation. That was the, what Piaget was taking a look at. And he said that children develop conservation of mass, and they were able to understand if you pour water from one glass to another, it retains its properties. So give a child a cookie who wants more cookies, and you break it in half, and you can see they have no conservation. But Vygotsky said, wait a second, teach them language teach them the word whole and half. And now when you do that to them, they're like, yeah, nice try, right? And now they can demonstrate conservation of mass. And they can probably demonstrate conservation of volume next, et cetera, et cetera. So basically Vygotsky said language was gonna drive that development. Okay. So again, there's lots of videos on that. Uh, at your age, you're at formal operational thought. You're able to think abstractly. You probably are still thinking conventionally. You know, I don't speed because others don't expect me to speed. Okay, I just don't want to get a ticket. And you can speak about what's not present. But again, emotions rule. Okay, you may even hold a personal fable that while well, you are special, and yes, you are, that you're invulnerable. But that's what causes that risk taking behavior. And then we've also talked about that spotlight effect already when I went over the, um, the three terms. Okay, so also when we talk about late adulthood, I'm gonna to have to run past this one. Uh, we are looking at a decline in intelligence and we're talking mostly, we're talking about formal intelligence. So I'm sorry, I went back too quickly there. Uh, in fluid intelligence, that very uh, speed of processing, right? How quickly we can go over things and remember things. Recall becomes uh, much uh, uh, harder than recognition, so free recall. And we're also now in that post-conventional development. What's right? What's true? What's fair? And I bring up Carol Gilligan because she said that, well, not everybody thinks morally the way Kohlberg says. Women tend to base their moral judgments more about relationships than principles of justice. So we're not going to have time to do some practice here. I'm so sorry. So I am going to move through this, and I am going to go directly. And these are here in case you want to go over them. Um, 
I'm going to go directly to some of the takeaways here. Uh, we have variations of traits in our population. Developmental psychologists use uh, twin studies and longitudinal research to take a look at change over time. Environmental factors can impact um, the expression of our genes. And those are all important takeaways. You're going to be looking at motivation. And I'd like you to consider what motivational theory explains why some of you contribute to stump, stump the teacher and others of you don't. OK. Um, and again, we are going to review motivational theories. This is your practice FRQ. Okay, take a look at this one. I am going to give you a chance to take a picture of this one. This is David. He's moving with his family. Okay, and then there's going to be uh, concepts that experience that will affect his experience, and then others that will affect a score he might have on his test. So your question: Some of you asked about grounding and negative punishment. Uh, grounding is negative punishment. It is a, a goal is to stop the behavior, so it's punishment. And when you take away someone's freedom, you're taking away something desirable. So I'll call that negative punishment. Um, addressing multi-part FRQs, we keep saying this, separate each term into a different paragraph, that's sufficient. And then using other AP psych terms within the application, please do, this is part of your vocabulary now. So if you need or you want to use a term that you learned in class this year, do it, you don't have to define it. Okay. Again, feel free to scan that QR code, fill out the form with any three words from the curriculum you don't think connect to each other, give us your feedback, your questions, and we'll be happy to try to get back to you. Thank you so much for today. So sorry I had to rush through that, but I hope you have a chance to go back and take a look at that video. Have a great day.